Ho, ho, ho. I thought you were going to say, ya, ho, ho, ho. <laughs> ya, ho, 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 ho. Till, till Santa swallows all, sets sail for third impact <laughs> anime. <laughs> And welcome to another episode of the Third Impact Anime Podcast. We're doing something a little different this time. We're going over our anime secret Santa picks. Uh, I will be your host today. I am Tobias, the Blue Nose Reindeer, on board the Merry Go. And I am joined by my co host. This is Bill, and I am cataloging and checking the anime Naughty or Nice list. I might have to check it twice. Or three times. Or five times. <laughs> and we have also have... Hey, I'm Austin, and my favorite Christmas carol is Joy to Zawarudo! It feels like Tokyo Tamares every December, for sure. <laughs> okay, well, let's give a little explanation for what this is. Uh, for, not, for people that aren't so in tuned into the Anna Twitter podcast world, the Anime Secret Santa is a thing done every year by bloggers and podcasters. This originally started with the Reverse Thieves podcast. Uh, the mantle was changed over to the AGC podcast a few years back. And word on the street is um, our friend Corey at the Taiku cast is going to be taking it on in the future. Uh, the general idea is that uh, people with uh, outlets, whether they be podcast or blogs or what have you, uh, all throw in. They all um, are you're chosen a secret Santa at random, and they provide their um, secret Santa with three choices of series based on what they do not have on their My Anime List, Anime Planet, Kitsu, what have you, uh, lists. Uh, I think last year, I want to say you and Bill both participated last year, correct? Uh, yeah, I did for sure. Um, I've participated, I think, twice at this point. This is going to be my third one and each each of those previous times i wrote my review as like a blog post on thirdimpactanime.com so this is the mm -hmm. first time i'm actually doing it like in podcast form which i would kind of prefer to do that anyway because i fancy myself much more of a podcaster than a blogger because i can i can speak a lot faster than i can mm -hmm. write so it'll be nice to actually verbalize and talk about my picks for this year but yeah it's it's always been a fun time and i'm really happy that you guys are here to uh, have fun with me and this is my actual this is my first time doing anime secret Santa. i've known about it on the okay. periphery for a while and i was always like a little nervous about doing it but i just said screw it i'm gonna take the plunge this year and give it a shot and it's been a lot of fun it's got me to watch things that i've heard about and then have been on my backlog for a while and funny enough and we'll get into this later but like my previous two secret santa picks that i've watched i actually really didn't like all that much i didn't click with them and you can go back and read my reviews if you'd like but i'm happy to say that this this time i actually really did click with my with my pick so that's good to hear yeah i'm, I'm kind of in the same boat as bill where i was I felt a little intimidated being among people that are already established in our community and also the the biggest hurdle being I curated my anime list <laughs> like I hadn't touched uh -huh. mine in about 10 years and even then it was uh geez I don't even know what I was thinking back in you know 2008 2009 did you, did you rate like elfin lead like a 10 out of 10 or something you know when I first saw it I probably did <laughs> that was a <laughs> that was a different age of Tobias let me put it that way um but I, I sat down I said you know what I'm gonna do it this year so I started fresh with a new anime planet after uh, hearing Austin talk about it earlier in the it's, year. It's a cool with website. Best I movies like it. Of, uh, what was it the movies of the 2010s podcast? Yeah, our best 15 of the of the 2010s. Yep. 
Yeah, an anime planner seems to solve a lot of my problems with my anime list. Uh, it seems like a website built in the past decade, for one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I put forth the effort and submitted it, and I'm really glad I did because, like you were saying, I, the, my picks were great. My picks were honestly things that I've been uh, wanting to watch anyway, so it worked out uh, overall. Yeah. Okay, I don't think well, I've ever gotten a suggestion of something that I just like was completely uninterested in. So shout out to all of my previous Santas and this one for giving me stuff that I think would actually be interested in. You know, whether or not I actually have time to get to them all is another thing. But yeah, everything has been uh, has been a good suggestion. And I definitely yeah. also plan to watch the stuff that I didn't get to. And yet you still didn't watch Kill Me Baby that you got last year. I did not watch Kill Me Baby. It's been a year. It's been a 365 days, give or take, and I still haven't watched Kill Me Baby. I am a pathetic. Well, maybe you'll get that again next year. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we begin, let's, uh, you know, this is the last episode we'll get before the holiday season, the second to last episode of 2022. So, Austin, why don't you hit us with some Christmas cheer and yeah. set the mood for us? So we know that, you know, out there in the world of anime, there aren't actually that many Christmas anime. You know, everybody talks about Tokyo Godfathers, which is, of course, the best Christmas movie ever made. And then mm -hmm. sort of people in the same breath jokingly talk about stuff like Itsudate My Santa, which is, of course, Bill's, fa uh, not Bill, Basil, <laughs> our friend Basil at the Awesome Cast. That's his favorite Christmas anime, of course. And uh, but I, I, I kind of wanted to pose this question to you all. So irregardless of whether or not the anime is actually about Christmas or centers Christmas at all, what is the most Christmas anime and what is the least Christmas anime to you? What do you think? Bill, do you want to go first? Sure. So the one that's the most to me, it just popped in my head would be uh Kayon did a Christmas episode mm, and okay. they, they didn't, it's not really about um, the holiday itself, but it's more of an excuse to just see friends and have a party, like, and all, and they decorate their house and they exchange gifts with each other, and uh, eat a lot of good food, and of course snow comes down at the very end. So, and I think um, for people who don't view Christ uh, Christmas as a religious holiday, it's a, it's also just a kind of a good coming together of friends. And uh, just giving kind of thanks and hoping for the next next year to be well. So uh, that's kind of what I think of as a the most anime Christmas thing I could think of would be the uh, Christmas episode they did in Kaon. And what is the least Christmas anime that you can think of? The least Christmas? Uh, <laughs> I, I need to finish it, but... Maybe the least Christmas would be like something like Black Lagoon. Because <laughs> I don't Why? I don't because like everyone's selfish and out for themselves. Yeah, and they're bounty hunters and it's all about the money. They're not they're not thankful for uh being together. <laughs> they they're just there because each of the pre each of the people in that group have a skill and they just want to get their money. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't I don't picture the characters of Black Lagoon uh, celebrating Christmas or having a Christmas party. Okay. Well, as far as myself, when I think of Christmas, especially Christmas in Japan and Japanese culture, you can't help but think of KFC. Mm. And mm. you can't help but think of KFC and not think about the Colonel. So I think the most Christmas anime is, in fact, Higurashi when they cry. <laughs> Please do tell. <laughs> well, yeah, no, I think I, I think. Considering what Bill was saying, there's a lot of anime that does Christmas episodes, you know, one-on-one -on -one shot sort of deals. But when I think of one particular work, um, besides the obvious ones, I think the uh, Harui Suzumiya movie makes me think mm. a lot of Christmas. It doesn't yeah. really revolve around Christmas. Well, I mean, the, the setting is Christmas, of course, but it's not about Christmas. But the imagery for that holiday is very present in that movie. It's it's very much like Die Hard. It's it's a Christmas movie without being a Christmas movie, uh, in the same vein. Uh, as far as least Christmas anime, I'm gonna also have to give that to Higurashi when they cry, because <laughs> when I think of Christmas, I don't think of little kids <laughs> killing each other. <laughs> no, I think the uh, the least Christmas anime. Um, you know, Christmas takes place in December every year, so the furthest point away from that 
would be in the summer when it is super hot. And that, of course, would be summertime rendering. Another <laughs> anime where kids kill each other. So there you go. I think you, I think you have a specific theme on your mind for some reason, <laughs> Tobias. Hmm. 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 <laughs> well, for me, I'm trying to think like the most Christmas anime. I'm actually going to kind of take Tobias's idea and kind of flip it on its head because I'm going to pick an anime that takes place. Uh, definitively in the summertime, and that's Barakamon. And we were actually talking about that in our Discord not too long ago because somebody yeah. brought up Bakuman, which is not the same anime. Uh, and it, it often gives, and whenever people in, uh, talk about ba- uh, uh, Bakuman, it gives me an excuse to uh, interject and be like, hey, actually, you know what's a good anime? Barakamon. And that is a good anime. Uh, it's It's about this guy who... Uh, struggles with anger issues being sent to the countryside to kind of chill out and uh, sort of buckle down and get really good at his uh, calligraphy craft. Uh, And uh, it's a great anime about like found families and like a bunch of, you know, weirdos getting together and, uh, and forming relationships and caring about each other and then doing things together. And like, I don't know, there, there's some good Christmas spirit to be found in in that i think Mm because it's all about relationships and you know growing into appreciation and thankfulness uh for the people around you so that's my most christmasy anime that i can think of least christmasy anime i don't know well one anime that i constantly think about during the winter months because i first watched it during winter time and it takes place during winter time i think is uh fate zero but uh fate zero (laughs) is uh is is pretty far from being uh, anything Christmassy, uh, much like Black Lagoon, all of the characters are kind of, you know, they have their own agendas. They are uh, out for themselves, uh, for their own goals and aspirations to win the Holy Grail War. And it's not very Christmassy at all, but it has a lot of snow in it. So there you go. All three of our least Christmas anime involve copious amounts of murder. So true. Murder is the least <laughs> Christmas thing you can do, folks. Keep that in mind. <laughs> it's- it's true. Santa <laughs> would is not the, like that. That is not a that is not a Christmas gift <laughs> you want to receive <laughs> or give. <laughs> okay, well, let's go out into the Secret Santa portion of our podcast. So right off the bat, we were each given three choices by our Secret Santas, and in turn gave three choices to our Secret Santas. Unfortunately, at this point, we can't reveal who uh, our our Secret Santas were. That's being held up until Christmas Day itself, but I'm 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 going to be very interested to see who got who, because I have sneaking suspicion who mine was, and I certainly I almost know for a fact whose Bill's was just based on the choices. But I don't want to say it's it's killing me, it's eating me up inside. I don't have to sit on this insider knowledge. But no, now let me ask let me ask you this real quick: do we do we want to say? what our suggestions were for the other person or i would hold off on that? that i would i would okay. hold off because that that would definitely okay. let them know and Vinny True. wants to keep this secret until last minute which is completely okay. under, a complete respect okay. but eating me up inside that i want to say <laughs> what my things are but regardless uh well, we had three each we could watch <laughs> all three if we wanted but we were only expected to watch one and i think all of us left something on the table so, Bill, why don't you let us know the one series that you did not watch? I failed. My goal was to do all three because everyone knows on this podcast I'm crazy and that how quickly I'm able to get through stuff and consume media. But I failed this time and that I didn't get through all three. I did not watch Chihaya Furu. Um, Shame. Shame. I know. Shame. I know. It's, Shame. It's, it's an anime that I've heard multiple people talk about. It's got a very strong following of just people praising it up and down, up and down. And it's something I want to check out. But just due to uh, some real life stuff that was going on and also <laughs> I'm watching too many seasonal stuff mm-hmm. uh, this to consume my time. So I only had time for two, unfortunately. You know, I feel that completely. I was in the same boat. I planned to watch all three of mine, but just because of everything else happening, I couldn't make it to my third choice, which was Kaiji Ultimate Survivor from 2008. This has been something that's been on my personal list pretty much since it aired. 
I think I did watch maybe three or four episodes at some point, but I I've been wanting to watch this, especially since Denpa was has been releasing the manga as of a few years back, and I still plan on watching it, but I just couldn't because of time constraints. And uh, for me, I well, I'm a full I'm a failure in multiple contexts on this one, which is nothing new, but um, my my pick has two seasons. And the second season's like a mini season, but I actually didn't get a chance to watch that. I was only able to watch season one. So I've got some some content left out there to play pickup on after this episode is over. And, of course, I didn't get a chance to watch my other two things, which were um, Boogie Pop Phantom, the original one from the late 90s, and then uh, Kino's Journey, 2003. So two, like classic like very melancholic series and then the one that i actually got is is pretty hype so i kind of went for the one that i knew was going to be a little bit more fun and energetic so that mm. that's kind of my reasoning for why i didn't get to those two can i ask it is funny I... that you got two series that are more slow yeah compared to the one you picked i, I definitely can see why you picked the one you did yeah I absolutely would, i would think you would have watched boogie pop fandom because i thought like tori would also be into that show so you might well, have you seen know, it already you know, we all have blind spots, and I've seen like, I've seen like th- two or three episodes of it, and I like it. It's it's pretty good, but it's just one of those things where I just haven't gotten around to version it yet. <laughs> if to be completely honest, you would have fallen asleep watching either Buggy Pop or Kino's Journey, so you know, it's a good I, thing you didn't. <laughs> I do like to fall asleep. It's been known to happen. Uh, I mean, I uh, bet you fell asleep to Great Pretender at some point. <laughs> oh, so I guess that is my show, huh? I did watch The Great Pretender. That is my show. Uh, well, we got Bill spoiling stuff, so why don't we uh, go ahead into the, the meat of the discussion. Bill, what was your first pick? You know, someone, the the um, person or persons, just uh, their first show they suggested was a very sophisticated, very complex show after <laughs> seeing probably... My, me watching all of LOGH and uh, <laughs> Godzilla Singing the Point. So they decided, you know what? We're going to send you something as sophisticated as that. We're going to send you Keijo. Mm. Uh, hi, <laughs> hi, Fip Girls from uh, 2016. So this is a show that I had known about mostly as a meme because um, people like AWO have talked about that show <laughs> a lot and it's appeared on their quizzes, their annual trivia episode every year. So it's something I'd heard about, but I just never found engaging or like, okay. But uh, basically the Anime Secret Santa gave me the excuse to watch it and I'm very happy I did. <laughs> Because this show is very absurd. Uh, So the basic premise is what if we combine Fist of the North Star like special moves but with fan service and their special abilities are not coming from their hands or their legs but their butts. And that... The goal, the main premise of Keijo is Keijo is a professional sports league where young girls and women are on different environments and they're trying to knock each other off with their butt into a pool of water. I know, a very complex sport. <laughs> mm. Sounds but, difficult. It's almost, it's almost like, like sumo in a way, but you're only allowed to use your, your bottom and your chest, kind of. Yes. You have to knock each other out of the arena. Yes. Um, yeah, it's but, like it, it, I mean, isn't 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 soccer rules exactly like that? You you can't use your hands; you can only <laughs> use your butt. <laughs> I don't I don't know anything about sports. Uh, in soccer, you can use your your feet, uh, your forehead, and your forehead. To, uh, but I think what I found surprising about K. Joe is I thought it was going to be a complete fan service show, like nonstop. And 
yes, there is fan service, like, of course, with the show, but they treat the sport super serious. Mm-hmm. Like, it's an actual, we treat it like it's an actual sport. We're not going to do, like, sound effects when each of them touch each other's butts. We're not going to do them making, like, ooh, ah, noises every time mm-hmm. they, uh, are in the sport with each other. No, they treat it like a shonen would treat a fight, which I've found surprising. <laughs> but I-, I just loved the absurdity of it. Like um, one one episode had the main character ripping turnips out of the ground using the power of her butt because <laughs> her train <laughs> the trainer said this will make your butt stronger. Um, everyone has like a special ability. Um, like one person is very good about um, sensing direction. One other person had a uh, higher speed by giving themselves like a super wedgie. <laughs> super wedgie, uh, huh? Yes. Uh, hardening your uh, <laughs> your breasts and your nipples allows you to do a harder judo throw with your body somehow. Oh, no. Uh. And it, it just it got absurd, like where the final fight was almost it was basically a Gundam character from like Gundam Double uh, Zero, where uh, they face against this person and their one personality, and then they flip their hair the other way and they're another personality. Oh, mm. <laughs> uh, I think one was, manga panel I saw back when it was airing is one girl has like the spirit of a wolf in her some, butt. Yes. Like yes. She summons, she summons a wolf stand. It's a, no. Pretty much. No. It's it's a dragon. It's a dragon oh, it's Tobias. A dragon. Okay. <laughs> We're Inside basic, each of our butt cheeks is one wolf. It's which a butt is dragon. basically it's like <laughs> they, the way it's the dragon is projected is like how a Yu Gi Oh card is projected in the Yu Gi Oh's <laughs> anime. But uh, yeah, I loved the fist of the North Star like absurdity with it, and it's funny to me that Zabak, who are now dead. Uh, they're mostly they were mostly known for their mecha shows and they were doing this uh the other thing that surprised me was uh how short this was because usually sports anime go very long like i i think of something more like ace of diamond or big wind up where it's multiple seasons or yamushi pedal and they could have dragged this out as long as they wanted to but they did not and I, is this well, based I like, on like a pre-existing material or is it an anime original it is a manga and the manga was okay. still going I, when when the yeah. anime was going yeah that's what yeah. i was gonna ask like how much uh, how much did they actually get to adapt versus what exists i think it, they adapted four volumes of the manga okay okay um but it goes at a very fast pace like they don't spend like so much time doing like tournament arcs like every single episode and all and the fights are usually under like one to two episodes which which is nice my only real my two big complaints with the show are one because of the short brevity which is nice it short changes other characters like only maybe one or two characters get a lot of main focus and it the other characters are kind of more incidental or there to show off a particular ability or power. Um, which, I mean, I'm not expecting like character complexity with this type of show, but it would have been nice to see other characters get more screen time. And then as like a petty complaint, and a, this is a bill fan service complaint. There, there was a lot, where was like the older women in the show? There was maybe like one older woman character that was basically the trainer and that was it. Which made me sad. I, I was hoping for more diversity of ages. But that, that did not that was not the case, unfortunately, which made me sad. Wouldn't be Bill so, if you weren't asking for the mom character. <laughs> <laughs> so um, how, how does it rank uh, compared to Idolmaster, which you just uh, reviewed <laughs> on the podcast? Um... Hmm. I think, do, do you I, think that do you think the show would have been better if they if they were singing while they were also trying to knock each other down with their butts? You know, they could have done a musical episode as a bonus. That would have been yeah. cool. But uh, <laughs> but no, I um I I, I, just, I can't compare them. They're apples and oranges. Uh, but I I enjoyed my time and I love the absurdity of it. So if you like things that are absurd and are able to make, not take things so seriously. 
I would highly recommend Ke- Keijo, which uh, I am surprised to say, but after I think after watching the absurdity that was Birdie Wing at times, this uh, was a nice kind of uh, s- pr- um, what's the word? A chaser, uh, maybe. Yeah, chaser for the more absurdity of Keijo. So. This is one of those things that has been on my list as well for a long time. Like I watched three or four episodes when they aired, but kind of never got around to it. Uh, I do appreciate that they take the sport seriously, though. They like the absurdity contrast with it being a a sports anime, and that's what I think makes it work rather than just being a fan service thing. That's probably why people tend to like it and recommend it to people because of those factors. Exactly. Yeah, I think if it was it's more of a fan. If it was more of just boob and butt fan service and that mm-hmm. was it, so uh, like a lot of things that uh, like companies have released, it would just the the people who are into that type of show would talk about it for a month and then it would go away. But Keijo has seemingly had more staying power. Where even though that show came out in 2016, I still hear people occasionally talk about it. Yeah, just reminds exactly. me how long ago 2016 actually was. A lifetime ago. This is this is Honestly. now a classic anime series. Yeah, it's vintage. <laughs> hey, Bill, any closing thoughts on Keijo? Uh, just just a grand old time. It's it's still streaming on Crunchyroll as of this recording. And did you Crunchyroll... watch the dub? Because I know I know Funimation uh, released it and they dubbed it. So did did you get a chance to listen to the dub at all? I don't watch dubs. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> yeah. do, do you even uh, speak english bill <laughs> <laughs> animal crossing language <laughs> yeah, I, i'm somehow i'm speaking english right now i only speak in murloc <laughs> Okay, well, speaking of English dubs, let me go on and go into my first choice, which was Housing Complex C. Uh, I bring up that comparison because uh, this is unique in that it is produced by Jason DeMarco and William Street of Adult Mm. Swim and Toonami fame. The actual staff were Japanese, but the, the money and the funding came from America. And... Uh, right now, you can watch the English dub on HBO Max. Uh, this did air just this October for Halloween. Uh, but the Japanese dub has not even like aired yet. So this is one of those rare series where we only have the English dub as of this moment. Oh, so hold on. Hold on just a second. So your your Secret Santa would have had to have recommended this to you like the week it came out. I, I guess that's the case. Um, you know, I didn't really think of it at that time. I only really noticed in compiling my notes for today. But yeah, that's, that's a good point. Maybe it was already sort of coming out. Uh, I could be completely and totally wrong, but I'm pretty sure I'm not. Yeah, uh, I anybody think it listening, is new. Yeah. Uh, if anybody wants to provide some additional context for housing complex C, feel free to do so. But um, yeah, so... Even though this was produced here by William Street, we have uh, the writer is has goes by the name Amphibian. Uh, they are a writer for horror games, uh, most notably Raging Loop, which has gotten oh, a lot yeah. of commendations and endorsements from you know, Geno Robochi and mm. Ryukishi Seven. So well established, um, you know, horror Japanese horror names, at least modern horror names. Uh, this was directed by Yuji Nara and animated by Akatsuki, which is notable because they are not notable. Uh, Akatsuki <laughs> has uh, only done in between anime production and some commercials, apparently, but not really. I think I saw one thing, some forgettable thing on their ANN entry. So, like, this is kind of their first thing that that they've done, really. And likewise, the director really doesn't have a, like any credits to his name besides this. So completely new entrance. Uh, however, there are, I would say there's at least one name that is notable. The character designs, the original character designs for this series were done by Yoshitoshi Abe of Serial Experiments Lane and Haibane Rinmei fame. Nice. Uh, so you can definitely see that uh, if you're sort of looking at the, uh, the series. Now, 
that all being said, we've got a couple notable names there, both East and West. What did I think about Housing Complex C? <sighs> I did not like it. Ooh. Mm. And to be to be completely fair, my secret Santa, let me pull up the email here. Uh, they specifically... Did they specifically say, you will not like this? Okay, so in my in the email I got, uh, they say, it was an interesting attempt at horror, and I'm curious to know what Tobias thinks of it, whether or not it was successful at what it set uh, out to do. So this person specifically asked for pain. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you, you get a Secret Santa gift, even if it's not something you want, you at least feign like you wanted it, you know? But this person specifically asked for my thoughts, so mm-hmm. I'm going to give it. I didn't like it. Now, <laughs> last night when we were talking about this podcast, I said, I cannot wait to tear into this series tomorrow. True. And I, I said that when I was just starting episode four. And what I'll say is that overall, I think the first three episodes, it, it's only four episodes, by the way, another interesting thing. Uh, my thoughts would be a lot worse if this were trying to do a full length show. But because it's only four episodes, it's like movie. So I could sit through it. That was my reason for doing so. Anyway, the first three episodes, I would say, were like a one star out of five. The fourth episode was a two star out of five. So it actually (laughs) improved the the series overall. And that really made me think, you know, it's one thing to just watch something you hate and you loathe and that's it. But because the last episode actually was a bit of an upswing, it got the gears in my brain working about what I thought about the whole thing, which is a little more complex than just complete despising it. Now, the major problem with Housing Complex C, and let me give a little synopsis here. So it is about an apartment complex, Housing Complex C, which exists on a seaside town, so almost like a rural uh, area. And it's about a couple of girls that live there, as well as some of the older occupants and sort of how they interact. It's Since it's more rural, everybody knows everybody. And there is some mysterious stuff starts happening. A underground storage unit is found with um, old uncovered things. There is a group of um, Muslim immigrants that show up. I believe they are Bangladeshi um, fishing interns that are staying a summer in Japan. But you have all these sort of elements that sort of create a mix, a an optical illusion, if you will, of uh, of strange phenomena. And it's only four episodes. It tells a pretty tight story of what it does. The problem with Housing Complex C is that it constantly references things that are better than it. Mm. (laughs) It is entirely possible to make a show or anything that is chock full and built on references of other things and make it better. We look at our podcast favorite series of Angelion, which is pretty much an Ultraman sent up, but it does something above and beyond that with the references that it creates. Uh, Guy and Axe and Trigger are all chock full of references, and I think that for the most part, they build upon those in a way that is better. However, Housing Complex C really seems like a pale imitation of these other things. So right off the bat, I already mentioned Yoshitoshi Abe, so immediately your brain starts thinking Serial Experiments Lane. And I think that these are kind of in the same genre of Japanese horror things. When you look at the cover for this show, it's two girls standing uh, under a sickly green apartment you know, lighting makes it seem that gives that creepy, eerie J horror sort of deal. Uh, mm-hmm. So immediately my brain evokes serious experiments lame. This just, it just, it just can't match up to that. They're both going for cosmic horror things. They're both going for that sort of terror, but this just really fails to build that up in the same way that lane does. Another aspect, um, this takes place in a rural area. They are sort of a tight knit community and weird stuff starts happening. You can't help, but think of Higurashi. I mentioned that earlier at the beginning of the podcast, but you can't the help but think of it anime. Here. Yeah, exactly. Um, and the problem, again, is that Higurashi just is better at what it's doing than Housing Complex C is. And I feel the reason for that, when it comes right down to it, is the way it handles Cosmic Car. When you look at Higurashi, there's a mysterious circumstance happening in this little village. It talks about these sort of ancient traditions and history and the way this community hasn't shed those more, uh, what do you say, those baser instincts being so um, separate from the community as a whole. Housing Complex C does this by invoking the Cthulhu mythos. 
And I don't mean that it is just kind of Lovecraftian. They literally show the Cthulhu mythos in this series. Like they the words, show you they like they show you the document. The the words Cthulhu mythos show up on a screen in this in the first episode. Wow. <laughs> there is Cthulhu. There is Deep Ones, the fish people, from apart from those mythos. There is Yoxatha shows up later. Like it is not Lovecraftian in nature. It is straight up a Cthulhu it's, it's, mythos story. It's literally just Lovecraft, is what you're saying. It, exactly. And okay. I was hoping that it would be more based on it. Uh, the, the 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 series ends with two twists, and I was hoping the last twist that it the series strongly hints that a twist anyone will see coming was going to make it a little original. But no, it's straight up Cthulhu mythos stuff. And ultimately, that's my problem with it. That like I like cosmic horror stuff. I like Lovecraftian style horror, but my problem with the Cthulhu mythos it has become like reading the monster manual of D anD. d You've taken the fantastical out of it because when you know what Cthulhu is, you know Cthulhu chants, you know uh, you know where Cthulhu comes from, you know that he's technically you know an elder elder god or deep one or whatever. Like you start, so many nerds and the and Cthulhu fans have like turned this into a reference book, almost a sci-fi series more than a horror. And for being a series that is all about the unspeakable, unknowable horrors of the vast universe. They've made it very knowable and very speakable, <laughs> which is why I kind of fallen away from Lovecraft's direct stories and the ones that came out of it, because it's just, you're just, re- you're just telling the same stories. You're just using the same names and repeating yourself. Again, look at something like Serial Experiments Lame. It is a thing which is very much a cosmic horror, but it takes place around the internet, creating a, an alternate plane of existence. It does not need to use the name Cthulhu or anything like that to invoke the horror. It creates it as you go. It is the the ending of the lane is unknowable. It is this wild thing happens just because the internet exists. There is no cosmic force at nature. It births itself, which is a lot more fascinating to me than just saving it being Cthulhu was the the bad guy at the end. Right. So that's a that's a well-worn thing that just we've seen over and over again. So it's like an old song. Like I've already heard this song. I don't need to hear exactly. it again. It'd be like, yeah. like doing a Dracula story where like, it's just it. He's the vampires. It's just Dracula. Like there's no twist. There's no like spin. There's no like new idea added in. It's just like, no, it's, it's literally just count Dracula. Exactly. If you were to think like a note for note retelling of Dracula, but in a modern setting, with no major changes and like you could do something with that, but housing complex C mostly doesn't. I'll say that there's two twists at the end and you know, two twists anybody could see coming. These are obvious. Now me personally, I like to watch horror with my brain turned off. I specifically like to not see the twist coming. I try to predict the movie. I know a lot of people make a game out of it, you know, sort of a cinema sin style. Let's point out the plot holes and see who the, 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 the actual murderer was. I personally don't like to do that. I like to suspend my disbelief to enjoy it. Uh, The first twist I didn't exactly see coming. And I thought it was, it actually is the part that redeemed the series to me a little bit. It actually seemed like it went from this series is stupid as hell to, Oh, it's trying to tell a competent trope. Okay. I'm on board for this. Uh, the, the, but the final twist was something that it pretty much tells you like early on in the series that it's obvious it was coming and it turned out exactly like it was. So, you know, I think ultimately what the show is is not for me. This is not a show for an anime veteran because you will compare it to Lane. You will compare it to Higurashi. You will already have the context for watching better horror series as a whole. But with this being a William Street production, I can see this resonating very well with the middle school, high school demographic. The people that, like me, was staying up late on week and weekdays and weeknights. Um, I'm sorry, uh, like week weekend nights, watching Lane on Tech TV, watching a Boogie Pop Phantom, and just catching random episodes that are creepy and a little strange, but still pretty understandable. Like the series is not, it's not well written, but it also means it's not that complicated. You can follow it what it's doing pretty easily, uh, almost to its so detriment at times. Is this I feel like, like a? Uh... Is this like a goosebumps situation where like it's horror made for an audience that really doesn't have that much familiarity with horror, which is why like all of the all of the tropes like are just the tropes and there's really no like 
creativity necessarily placed upon it do you think it is kind of that way or or is there something to lead you believe that like this is not really for a younger audience that it really is it's really supposed to be for adults guys like what what do you think about that I that that's a great way to put it. This is again something that you would see late nights on tech TV, like when I was in you know in middle school watching um, stuff like Gundam Wing and Tenshi Muyo on Toonami. When you stayed up late to watch the unedited versions, oh oh my god, guy, there's blood in it. This is stuff for adults. You know that was kind of the feeling I had watching those shows. Like oh my god, they use cuss words. Goku said, "Damn, oh my lord, this is this is wild, man." That that's the sort of thing here is that. I could see a kid getting into anime and maybe new to horror watching this and freaking out because there's blood and they're stabbing each other. Like I can see that being something they would enjoy. You know, the sort of the type of person that watched Ninja Scroll way too early. You know, we, mm-hmm. we sort of joke about that. And obviously a kid should not watch Ninja Scroll for reasons. But on the other hand, we all watched Ninja Scroll when we were kids. So like, can we really say that? That's kind of what I feel here. You know, maybe it's maybe a little mature for actual kids, but it's ultimately a show that's made to appeal to someone with uh, a little less understanding, which is funny because, because the Cthulhu stuff is on its sleeve. I kind of feel like it would appeal to Lovecraft nerds. The people that, that pointed it out. I certainly, I mean, I've, I've been aware of those stories for a while. One of my, one of my best friends is really into the mythos. So I've, you know, heard of these things. I've played the role-playing game. Uh, the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game is actually really popular in Japan right now, more popular than Dungeons & Dragons. So it's, it sort of makes sense to see more anime um, use this sort of stuff. Uh, even Pop Team Epic this season has referenced Nerolithotep and Cthulhu as jokes, as bits uh, in, in, in the series. So it, it's kind of funny to see it finally become mainstream. But just because I personally have almost a vendetta against it because it's become so cliche and tropey to me, I feel like that's actually a detriment to the storytelling it's trying to do. Hmm. Tobias, you, you've talked a lot about the narrative and your kind of issues with it, but how is the animation for such a kind of a new team? Uh, very basic. So basic. Oh my God, so basic. Uh, another reason I think anatomy veterans such as myself would not enjoy it. Um, if they just, the character designs are what they are. You know, we talk about Abe doing the, the original character designs, but the way it's translated to anime, you know, the, there's two cute little girls. There's just generic, cute little girls. There's, I mentioned there's a whole bunch of, uh, Bangladeshi interns that show up. And that's one whole aspect that we bring up on the story is the sort of inherent racism by the, the rural Japanese people and these, um, these, 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 these Muslim characters, there's one in particular, sort of the hero Khan, that he's a big, bulky Hulk of a man. That's also kind of simple, uh, not very bright. And the way they draw him is just, it's just, he almost looks like he's made of stone because his face is just etched in stone and it just doesn't seem to be well done. Mm. I could see mm. this again, there's something that I think would appeal to someone who doesn't know better. But if you're coming to this looking at like Sakaga, you know, you're looking at four episodes, you might think, oh, they really spent time on those four episodes, just like the old OVA days. You know, rather than trying to stretch it out to 26 episodes, four episodes mean they could spend more money, right? Well, no, the animation is just there. It's present. I didn't really think it was anything to write home about at the end of the day. And I can't really think of anything I really loved about it, to be honest. It was passable. It was there. I guess I'll just take this opportunity to recommend that everyone play Bloodborne. <laughs> <laughs> now for something uh, completely different. <laughs> I guess uh, one thing I would say, um, I see a lot of people talk about the music. Rather, the the one thing that people don't give a really terrible score is the sound design, which mostly is okay, but I thought the opening was okay. It wasn't bad. It wasn't amazing, but it was a competent opening animation and song compared to how incompetent the rest of the show feels. So, I mean, if you, if you don't, if you're looking for something to watch next holiday season, next, you know, Halloween season, and you have like two hours to kill and just want to watch something on your HBO max uh, list. Sure. Give it a shot. Try it. Um, The first three episodes are very stupid. (laughs) And I don't mean that just to be insulting. They're just really, they're dumb on purpose. Because the fourth episode shows you that it was done on purpose for a reason. Don't think you're watching anything great is very much a way to kill two hours and to have some 
Cthulhu tropes thrown on, you know, it's there. It's uh, I'm glad it exists for other people, but compared to the other show that I watched, which was better in all regards, it's really it's a tough sell for me. So, so again, I think I think my secret Santa for giving me something to chew on, even though I didn't like it, I did have a lot of thoughts. I did go from despising it to actually thinking about it, and I'm gonna probably check out the visual novel that Amphibian worked on, Raging Loop, because of how many good reviews it's gotten. So I do want to thank my secret Santa, but again, you asked for it. I didn't like the show. <laughs> so um, you could sum what? it up with a uh, housing complex. See you later. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. So th- th- you might not have realized, but the C in housing complex C is for Cthulhu. Whoa. <laughs> crazy. Whoa, whoa. And, and, and in the show, they talk about a, you know, an ancient myth about how the seaside town uh, came into being. And they talk about a God called Kuzu Lulu, which Kuzu is Lulu. not <laughs> at all supposed to be Cthulhu. <laughs> It's just it's the series is full of groaners like uh, it, like, it, oh, it's my. it's uh it's Lulu from Final Fantasy X just playing the kazoo. <laughs> kazoo Lulu, that would have been a much better uh, show. <laughs> I, I have a, I have a quick little sidebar. So this is yeah. another HBO Adult Swim original anime production, and yeah. so so far the track record has not been the best in the world. And I know it, like I say this with like everyone i know whatever you're working on they're they're doing their best they they ha- might have budget constraints time constraints but on top of this and then the not so great things i've heard about uh blade runner black lotus uh which i i know people have problems with and then i i, I just i'm wondering like how are these productions are being perceived because they're funded by hbo slash adult swim and so far, I haven't heard anybody really talk about them. Um, I know they have Uzumaki coming next year, which I know Tori and Austin and I are really excited about. And based off the previews they've shown, it looks gorgeous. It really but, does look yeah. good. And I, I hope that this is that Uzumaki will be the exception because it kind of needs to be since it's a prestige property. For it sure. needs to it needs to be and just the other ones haven't hit, haven't hit or just haven't gained any traction, unfortunately. Um, from, I think that kind of comes down me. to uh, Adult Swim. Like the certain the type of person that still watches Adult Swim is either going to be the kids that this is pretty much the only their access to it. It's going to be the early twenties stoner that is just watching stuff, you know, at midnight and is amazed by anything, no matter what anime it is. They're just they're just happy to be watching Japanese animation and with you know with their brains turned off. Are these the Adult Swim? The, you have a, a, a genre of diehard fan that just watches anything that comes on the TV because they have nostalgia for the programming block as a whole. I think this is kind of for those people. For someone like myself that is a, an anime pervert that like knows things like the animation studios that knows names of directors, you know, that knows names like Gen Urobuchi and Ryukishi 07. Like, this is not for us, I feel like. And you're right. Like, are these shows actually doing anything for the the stakeholders at play? Who knows? But you have something like Blade Runner that got a big push a few years back. I can see why they would just throw throw franchises into the content mill. All right. Well, that's uh, let me let's go ahead and continue before I continue to rant about Housing Complex C. Uh, I did <laughs> mention you know, try to watch it next Halloween if you can, but because it's on HBO Max, it may not be on the service for a whole year. So maybe try to catch it sooner rather than later if that maybe strikes your fancy. Before well, it gets be written honest. off on their taxes. Exactly. <laughs> well, let's go to something a little more upbeat. Austin, yeah. uh, we already actually spoiled what you talked about.
Yeah, so Bill said it. I got uh, Great Pretender, which is another streaming exclusive series, but this time it's on Netflix, and it came out in uh, like 2020, or at least the first chunk of it that did, and then another chunk of episodes covering sort of the final arc came out maybe six months to a year later, but I just watched like the first chunk because the way the Netflix uh, sorts it out on their service is that, you know, the first drop is season one, the second drop is season two. So I just watched season one. Uh, It is a anime original uh, property uh, created by Studio Wit, who you probably know as the principal studio behind uh, Attack on Titan uh, and a number of other things like uh, Awari no Seraph. Vinland Saga, yeah, that's right, and uh, lots lots of things that you'd be familiar with, and it was directed by a guy who doesn't have a huge anime career, but he directed things such as uh, 91 Days from 2016, he also directed uh, a shoujo anime called uh, Kimi, Kimi ni Todoke, which was pretty popular for a while, and that's uh, Hiroshi Kaburagi, and the screenplay was written by... Uh, Ryota Kosawa, who's mostly known for doing like uh, live action, live action movies and TV and stuff, so he doesn't really work in anime that much. But I think that kind of leans into some of the things that I like about uh, Great Pretender uh, that I'll get into shortly. But um, probably the thing that you guys would be no- most familiar with about Great Pretender is that the character designs were done by Evangelion's own Yoshiyuki Sadamoto. Mm-hmm. So if you look at them, you can uh, very, in, especially in some of like his actual art, you can see, oh yeah, these are, these are Sadamoto characters. Like they have, you know, echoes of uh, of Evangelion and Nadia and Fooly Cooly and stuff that uh, are kind of there. Even though the character designs are, you know, fairly simple overall. Like the main character uh, Edamura kind of just looks like Shinji, but older and more lanky and has more hair. Uh, which is not not uncommon for Sadamoto, because I think we've all seen the meme about like how to draw Shinji, and then you just draw Nadia and like <laughs> get rid of her earrings, <laughs> uh, which is a good meme. It's a good good joke. But um, so the general premise around uh, Great Pretender is that you follow this group of uh, con artists, basically, and uh, there's a, a group of Ah, one, two, there's like four central con artists that you follow. They're a little bit like the Lupin gang, but they're a little bit, they're not quite as like chummy as as the Lupin gang tends to be, or like the Cowboy Bebop gang. It's like they're they're definitely more like co-workers than like friends in that sense. And they don't really, I mean, they do, but they don't really develop that camaraderie with each other as the show goes along. But, but anyway, the show is kind of broken into, uh, a few episode chunks of like specific cons that they're trying to pull off. Like the Mm -hmm. first con in the first chunk of episodes is that, uh, Edamura, our point of view character and uh, Laurent, who's like a seasoned uh, con artist, and he goes after like uh, really big fish. Like he goes after like um, really powerful people and tries to rip them off. Whereas like Edamura, our POV character, he's more of like a small time crook. Like he he tries to scam people out of like the first scam that you see him do is like he tries to scam somebody out of like like a few hundred dollars for like some like their air conditioner being broken or something like that like a really small uh, scam like that but he gets he gets in with Laurent and they try and rip off a big time Hollywood producer by uh, who is also a drug dealer they try and sell him like a fake drug that's like oh it's the greatest drug ever created by science Uh, but it's actually like just candy and they do this whole elaborate con to get him to be convinced that, like, it's this really cool hot new drug that's going to, like, uh, you know, change the world and everything. It, that first con is, like, so obviously inspired by uh, Breaking Bad and, like, some of the things that happen in Breaking Bad. Because, like, there's, like, this whole section where, like, they're, like... They're building the meth lab essentially, and there's a. It, it's not like a one to one comparison, but there are some cam, there are some uh, things in common between like 
the Hollywood mogul who's also secretly a drug dealer, like between him and like uh, Gustavo Fring and, um, you know, just all these characters with their own individual motivations trying to like keep the lies going and what they will do to try and keep the lie, you know, alive so that they can get what they want and rip off the people they're trying to rip off. Um, let's see. Oh gosh, where else do I go with this? There's so much that happens in the show. And that's that the, the whole drug dealing con is like the first story. And then there's two more stories in the season. The second one is about like, like an airplane race. And then the last one is about trying to con this um, art dealer who's like this huge scumbag that some of the characters have a history with. Um, but overall, I thought the show was really very enjoyable. I thought that the cast of characters were uh, very fun, and each each part kind of loosely centers around a different character, and you kind of figure out their backstory and their motivations a little bit more. Like, the first one follows Edamora, our POV character, and we get a lot of um, things about him, like why he's a con artist, um, and uh, sort of his fraught relationship with his family. And then in the second one, it follows... Um, another character in the gang named Abigail and like she comes from she's like a a former child soldier from the Iraq war and she's got a really interesting story and it kind of evolves like her history with like her family being involved in like the bombing of of Baghdad and things during the war in Iraq and like she has a confrontation with a uh, a military soldier who was there at the time and that's some really good drama and then the third one is about uh, Cynthia, one of the other characters, and like her her history with how she became a con artist, and like her ex lover being uh, this guy who was like famous in the art world, but did some very unethical things. I know I feel like I'm probably losing you guys because I'm bringing up so many things, but this show has a lot of stuff in it. It's like a very <laughs> busy show. It sounds like this show doesn't have the what I what I like to call the least valuable player syndrome, where it seems like okay, in this little story arc, we're gonna focus on this character from the group, and then we're gonna move over to a new arc to shed more light on this character. So that mm-hmm. way, you get to know each individual member of this uh, of this group. So that way, they feel like fully fleshed out characters, and you get to know their backstories as they go on yeah i i think that this show actually does a really good job at that i mean i don't i don't think that every single characters whenever they do get their moment to get their background story told or them to do their character arc i don't think it always pays off completely in a way that i would want it to like i feel like in the second part with abby and her story of being like a child soldier i think it kind of it doesn't resolve that satisfactorily. It feels like they just kind of had to wrap it up really quickly. And I won't say exactly why, cause I don't want to spoil anything, but it's like, I wish there was a little bit more to that. Um, so it's, it's not perfect, but I feel like everybody gets their, their time in the sun. Everybody gets their just due in terms of, you know, screen time and, uh, allocation of, of, um, of script to the specific characters. And then there's like this revolving cast of, uh, of side characters that show up. Like there's these, this, uh, this older Japanese couple that shows up that, uh, helps them pull off these cons every once in a while. And they're, they're really good comic relief. And so it's, it sounds like this show's kind of going for a mixture of Lupin third mixed with kind of modern, kind of con artist type movies like i like the i think it's i think it was david uh oh nope forget his name the guy who did the oceans movies the, mm-hmm. the modern ones um uh Lupin yeah, I would maybe say that this a mixture is, yeah a, a mixture of the character dynamics in, in bebop somewhat yeah absolutely i mean those things definitely permeate this whole whole show i, I mean i i think that especially with the very jazzy soundtrack it's 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 like they're pulling from you know classic hollywood capers and stuff like the oceans movies in addition to something like loop on the third like i think this is like if if loop on the third were being made like now i feel like this is kind of what it would be mm-hmm. like if loop on the third is a brand new property was like conceived of in like right. 
the 2010s, it would probably be a show that looked a lot like The Great Pretender. Because, you know, Lupin the Third was sort of conceived where, like, the idea of, you know, just walking in and robbing a bank maybe not wasn't that so far-fetched. But nowadays, like, criminals have to be really smart and clever to pull off cons like this. And I feel like it would look a lot like The Great Pretender. Um, Does it have kind of a wacky aspect to it? Or is it more based in the real world? It's it's extremely grounded. Um I think there are some things that are a little bit fantastical, but most of the stuff that happen in the show is like fairly believable, which I, which I think is why I would say, I don't know if the writer has specifically said so, but why I, I feel like Breaking Bad is, is something that would be pretty influential on this because, you know, even there's a lot of things that are a little far fetched in Breaking Bad, but most of the stuff in it are, is like, it's re- reasonable that it could happen. Like, there's not too much suspension of disbelief going on here, and I feel like uh, the Great Pretender is also fairly plausible in that regard. I mean, not not completely, but it's mostly pretty grounded. It's not like Lupin the Third, where just like they, you know, they they pull off these nonsense things and are able to steal stuff like the Statue of Liberty, just like these inconceivable. <laughs> like yeah. nonsense heists in Lupin the Third. Like that's just not that's so, not the tone so that Great Pretender's going for. So it definitely there's feels not. like they are going for like almost the Hollywood Tarantino style of gangster thing that is definitely com- comedic in what it's doing, but also, you know, people are shot and stuff like that happens. It's yeah. not goofiness. And there are lots mm. of real stakes too. Like, um, like I said, with with Abby being like a child of the Iraq War, it's just like, well, that was an actual mm. thing that happened. You know, there were actual people traumatized. You know, civilians there um, that have to deal with you know their family being murdered um, in front of them and stuff like that. So that's really real. And then there's a side plot with a character like who was uh, the veteran involved in the Iraq war and sort of his baggage that he carries back home with him. And also the fact that he gets in this like airplane accident and like, is like basically paralyzed. So there's like a lot of things going on that are pretty real. And then in the third story, it's like very much like the, the aftermath of like a, uh, a relationship gone wrong. So like you see, like the, our, our character, Cynthia, like you see, you've seen her, and who she is in the present up till this point. And then you kind of get a glimpse of like what heartbreak in her life sort of, you know, switched a button in her brain from being like this, um, this uh, more happy go lucky girl who really wanted to like become an actress to basically, you know, becoming very cynical and becoming like a a professional con artist. Like you kind of get, you know, where she came from and sort of what traumas led her to different decisions that she made in her life. So Mm. it's, it's pretty grounded. It's very, it's very Hollywood. I would definitely say so. And it's very unabashedly. So, I mean, the the first scene in the first episode is where, uh, Laurent and Abby basically in in an attempt to uh, coerce Edamura into working for them, they hang him upside down by a, by a a rope from the Hollywood sign. So, you know, it's very like, (laughs) it's very Hollywood film inspired. Yeah. Mm. You mentioned earlier this being sort of a, a modern day Lupin in some ways. Do you feel that like Lupin, it could be a forever series or does the ending like really definitively wrap up Great Pretender? Well, so far from what I've seen in this first season, and I know generally speaking what happens in the next set of episodes that I do plan to watch, it feels like a story that if they wanted to make more and more Great Pretender with this cast of characters, they easily could. But it seems by by the way that they've specifically structured this story, it's just like each part of it, it they call them cases, like they're broken up into cases, and there's four cases. Um, there's four cases for the four main characters. Each case is a different con, but it's also a different focus character where we learn about them. And once they're done with all four characters, I mean... To me, that sounds like they're done with the series. But if they wanted to kind of abandon that format and just do, like, caper stories or um, heist or uh, con artist stories, they very easily could do that. But that would just be up to whether or not, I guess, they could think of really good uh, cons to come up with. But it's not really like Lupin, where these characters are more archetypes that you can just throw into stories forever and ever. This no. is a specific narrative that happens and yeah. it comes to a resolution. 
Pretty much. I mean, I, I think it's more like Bebop in that regard, where, like, if you look at Cowboy Bebop, you could easily see how they could do more, but it's, like, a pretty wrapped-up story. And I have a feeling that by the end of the episode, the second season, it's probably going to be like that. But unfortunately, I've also heard that the second season isn't that strong, so we probably won't get any more Great Pretender anyway. But I will say, you know, even with that being said, I've really enjoyed... I really enjoyed watching what I did. I think the first the first case with the drug dealer is by far the most interesting. The one with the airplane race I thought was a little bit hit or miss. It could have been a little bit better, could have been probably could have picked up the pace a little bit. And then the third one is like very much focused on like this sort of lost love plot, which makes it really distinct from the other two. So I very much enjoyed that one as well. So it it's kind of up and down just like you know, certain episodes of Bebop or certain episodes of, or certain like takes on Lupin the third. Yeah. I mean, I watched an episode or two of this. I think, uh, I think I, didn't we watch the first episode? I think in the Maybe. old apartment, it's, I seem to recall Probably. that. Yeah. And what, what, what I remember the most is, are like the visuals specifically yeah. the way that there's, there's lines, but the shading is very like solid shading. Yeah. It's, it's not very rounded. I do distinctly remember the scene where they're in the pool the, the, that's the, right the big head onches pool mm-hmm. and like abby like eats the the candy drug and she like mm-hmm. flips her shit and starts running around the pool and going crazy <laughs> to convince him that it's you know it's it's good stuff right i, I think the thing that stands out the most to me in memory was the visuals and how yeah. bright everything was so apparently the production team was really inspired by a british artist named uh, brian cook who paints these um he mostly does landscapes and he does it in like extremely like blocky like primary and secondary colors like not a lot of um what's the word i'm looking for like earthy tones just like very gaudy garish like block colors and that is very very well translated into this whole show like they keep that up consistently and it's always on point uh, the color design in the show is just immaculate and i would love to see more shows sort of take like a specific design or color aesthetic and just like completely commit to it just like they did in great pretender so i i would say that the 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 visuals of episode one that stuck out stood out to you they maintained throughout the whole thing and i'm very grateful to say that i quickly googled brian cook and i completely see what you mean Yeah, yeah absolutely inspired by this guy's stuff i get this show confused a lot with super crux another netflix thing that came out Mm-hmm. Within like a year of it, it doesn't look like it's connected at all. But maybe this, there's been a lot of said about the Netflixification of content, and I kind of have to wonder if anime is subject to this as well. These both have yeah almost similar designs in ways. The way the colors are flat mm-hmm. more so than traditional stuff. Well, I think that mm-hmm. Great Pretender uses this to it to its advantage, you know, because it is a it's a distinct aesthetic decision. Um, and it it makes it it makes it uh vibrant and interesting but one thing i will say on that note slightly different than what you were going for is that i think great pretender probably could have benefited from a weekly episode release model because most of the episodes do end on like pseudo cliffhangers to get you interested in watching the next episode but that's rendered mute on Netflix for reasons I don't have to explain. So I yep. do kind of wish that this had been a streaming show on like something like Crunchyroll or High Dive or what have you so that, you know, the anime community could have capitalized on this sort of, you know, weekly uh, heists that they're trying to pull off. You hear that, Netflix? When Still Ball Run comes out, make it weekly. Please bring back JoJo's Fridays. It doesn't even have to be Friday. We can have JoJo's Friday on a Tuesday. I don't care. Just do it weekly. Like I know people have said it a lot. A lot of people like the um, binging format, but I'm, I'm going to put my flag in the sand. It's bad. It you is. You need bad. to watch things every week no. to maintain hype. <laughs> I, I think the problem the problem is like when it was new, like when House of Cards is coming out for the first season. Mm. It was the only thing of note. And I think the problem is Netflix has a does a not great job at marketing what they have. And they're not good at pushing what they have because they're always going on to the next thing, next thing, next thing, next thing, next thing. Um, 
I think the weekly model would help a lot, but I think just because of the glut of stuff they produce, it just gets lost in their soup. And you lose those individual shows that might be very that might be very good. And just it's it's the it's the over choice problem. If you give a customer too many choices on the shelf, they just get overwhelmed and they go to the same thing they've had for twenty years. They're gonna go back and mm-hmm. watch the officer or they're gonna go back and watch Friends, even though or or Seinfeld, something akin to that. I guess to go back to Great Pretender, just because kind of a last thing, one one thing that is very unique about it is that it mostly takes place outside of Japan and centers non-Japanese characters, which is still pretty mm-hmm. uncommon for anime if it's not like a fantasy thing. And it, it also it also plays with that too. Like there are some jokes um, that the director specifically talked about in a couple of interviews where he pokes fun at the idea of like people outside of Japan and outside of Asia sort of see all Asian people as the same. Like there are a couple jokes where uh, Edamura, like people think he's Korean or they think he's Chinese or he's Taiwanese, <laughs> and he always is just like, "No, I'm Japanese." Like Japan is not these other countries, and like they kind of play it off as a joke, but that's that's also like a very real thing that happens. I mean, I, I know we all uh, have ran into people thinking like, "Oh, all of Asia is the same," so it is kind of funny whenever they play play that up for for a good joke. But you agree. I, the one thing I do remember is L- Laurent is he's a French guy, right? He is French, right? I remember that being a thing. Speaking a lot of French, and, and not, not not that you'd never see that in in anime, but to have a you know French dialogue happen was kind of neat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Edamura is Japanese. Laurent is French. Cynthia, I think, is American, and then Abby is from um, Iraq. So, would you say at the end, uh, at the end of the day, is this worth a watch? Who would you recommend the show for? I'd recommend this to pretty much anyone. I mean, I think it's it's highly enjoyable. I mean, your mileage may vary on how much you enjoy each specific story, but I would think that at the very least, everybody should go out there and check out the first story, like the 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 drug dealer, uh, the drug dealer con story is is probably the best, and it's only the first five episodes, I think. So if you watch that, it is a complete story, and if you want to keep going, definitely do that. But I, I think that that, you, that specific story is like pretty standout. So yeah, go check it out. I would highly recommend Great Pretender. And the ending song is Great Pretender by Freddie Mercury. So that's awesome. Which means it'll never come out on physical media because that song is so expensive. <laughs> they will just replace it with uh, Fly Me to the Moon again. A cover of a cover of a cover to lower the cost down. <laughs> okay, well, that being said, Bill, why don't you go ahead and hit us with your second Secret Santa pick? Austin, do you want to spoil it? Because uh, I, I spoiled <laughs> yours. I think that'd be fair. Uh, hold on. Hold on. Uh, yeah, Bill, are you ready to go? <laughs> the, the, the brand new world da, you are da, watching da, da, brand da, new da, animal <laughs> yes um another so netflix show another netflix show because it was another on netflix nobody another watched Nef- it beca- <laughs> another <laughs> netflix even, show even, with a great color palette <laughs> mm, that's right yeah yep yeah. yeah. birdie my dog birdie agrees great color palette <laughs> thanks brody uh so stop 
Stop! Sorry, Birdie's I, I barking. Stop, Bill. <laughs> okay. Can you got uh, Can nobody else hear my dog? No. I I only hear you. Okay. Yeah, I watched brand new Animal uh, BNA on Netflix. It is a studio trigger show. Uh, shockingly, uh, if, if I recall, Tobias and Austin, you neither of you have finished it with your love uh, of trigger. I which, have. So, I have. I have watched the whole thing. Oh, okay. Yep, I watched right, it. Correct. I watched it not right when it came out, but probably a few months later. Hmm. Yeah, I watched up to the baseball episode, and you know, you peak then, you can't recapture that magic, so I stopped. <laughs> but you missed I, such I, a that, good... Yeah. Oh, great, great you baseball missed, episode. Everybody talks about that, but... Uh, and yes, that in terms of animation, the baseball episode is probably the highlight of the show. But I'm going to say this now. This was my favorite Studio Trigger thing I've ever watched. Whoa, that is yes. high praise. Controversial, controversial hot take as always hot from take. Bill Foreman. Okay, so Dang. I'll try and keep this short. So I've had a, 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 a push and pull with Trigger and like that I will appreciate how crazy they'll go with animation, but their narrative story that they usually present I don't care about or a character will really annoy me <laughs> and will take me out of the show. So like the char- certain characters in Gurren Lagann really annoyed me. Certain characters in Little Witch Academia an- annoyed me. <laughs> and then don't, I don't want to hear what these are. No. I hate you. That that's I why I'm keeping that's what, that's why I'm keep, that's why I'm keeping it vague. I'm not saying okay. the names. I couldn't even pronounce the names. You know this. Little Witch Academia is flawless. I agree. But for the sake of we'll conversation, for the sake of conversation, <laughs> and, then, and then and then and just Trigger has always focused on the animation quality over their narrative, which is a choice. And for me, there's narratives, whether that be Premiere or whether that be there are some of their other works that I've just never really connected to. But I felt like the narrative for BNA was right up my alley because it almost had a noir-like quality hmm. uh, to the story because it's about a girl named uh, Michiru who at first is a human but then she wakes up and learns that she is transformed into a tanuki and the the pre- main premise of the show is the uh, in the in the modern world there are these humanoid beings called beastmen that are um like half human, half beast, um, that can transform into different types of animals. Humans Which do not I like w- them. We should note, by the way, that they are distinct from the beastmen at Gurren Lagan. These are allegedly <laughs> not the same beastmen, even though it's the same gosh darn name. Hey, if they have the trademark, we got to use the trademark. So, <laughs> okay, we can you can just say furries. It's fine. This is 2022. <laughs> That's not a bad word anymore. <laughs> Uh, but that's what the show calls them they call them beastmen in the show (laughs) i'm going by what the show says right right so so the and so she goes to a city in uh i think it's in japan called uh anima city where basically all the beastmen live and at first she's very idealistic of like this will be a utopia for me i will be accepted and she quickly learns that not everything is is sunshine and roses and that these uh the beastmen in the city are kind of sweeping by because they don't they're not given support by the japanese government um they are basically looked down upon and there is almost like a container thing where we just want you to stay there and but if you cause any trouble we are going to shut you down and uh she basically gets in with this uh this wolfman who's basically works as a uh, detective slash enforcer for the mayor investigating uh, underground uh, activities happening within the city because there are different factions uh, in the underworld that cause issues. And um, not ev- even if they are beastmen, they all have their own agendas. 
And so it's it's a very kind of you're living in a morally gray world and you have to kind of figure out your way around it. And at first, each of the kind of the early episodes are dealing with the overall effects of the city. Like when I when episode is dealing with uh, human trafficking, basically, um, where at first she thought, oh, these these people were giving these children uh, basically free education and looking after them. No, they're, they're using them for their own purposes, even if they are of the same uh, marginalized group or how uh, one of her friends gets in with who comes in later um is part of like this cultist group that plays a larger role go- going on, or how humans on the uh, in the in the other in the human world have kind of a um, mixed perception about the beastmen. So I, and there's a lot of red herrings to the to the main overall plot that goes on. So just it kept me guessing, and because of this kind of morally gray tone to the narrative. It made me uh, really excited and kept me engaged. And uh, it kind of reminded me a lot of noirs that I've been watching in this past year from the 50s and 40s. Um, not yeah, in I've terms been watching of a lot of vision. those. Yeah, a lot, a lot of uh, like visual, not in terms of visual aesthetic, but in terms of the, the narrative structure. So I can see that for sure. Yeah. So. And I think because um, it had, um, like, like I said, because it had a stronger narrative structure, uh, I was more engaged with it than m- most trigger shows. I think the principal creative guy behind this one was probably Yoshinari, if I had to imagine. It's definitely, he definitely, yes, definitely is him. his um, character designs. But I, I tend to gravitate a lot towards Yoshinari's stuff because they tend to be a little bit more... Um, like how do i say it like imaishi is like all about like bombast and insanity and i like Mm -hmm. that but yoshinari tends to take his time a little bit more and like develop things out and like create a world and create characters so Mm -hmm. i really respect that and i all i also really enjoyed bna whenever i watched it i thought most everything came together pretty well i remember being dissatisfied with a couple of plot points towards the very end or a couple of choices but i don't remember enough details to really articulate what those things were Hmm. but i think my favorite episode apart from the baseball episode being just like really fun was the mini arc with what is it the mermaid girl yeah we're basically the mermaid the mermaid girl is uh, the daughter of basically the crime boss of Anima City, and she really wants to be with the humans. It's, it's almost kind of the plot of like the Little Mermaid, if you think about it. Where in she, the plot of the Little she's Mermaid, she's like an online, she's like an online idol or something, right? No, no. Okay. It's some, I think you're thinking of somebody else. But she basically Maybe. wants to hang out with uh, humans, and she gets invited to this party, and Michiru kind of tags along, and at this party. They have a while they're very friendly. They're friendly to her. They have a giant misunderstanding that puts the mermaid uh, girl's life in jeopardy um, because of their misunderstanding of how uh, kind of the beastman body works. Because um, they think, oh, because she's a mermaid, she just wants to be in water, when that's not the case. Um, and there's like a whole bullying angle or something like that too, or like a misunderstanding. Yes, yeah, uh, yes, they're ex- exactly on the on the head. And uh, while this series is over, and I I think it's basically wrapped up. If they wanted to go back to this world, I think they could because it felt like a real breathing world with uh, other characters going on, and just it's it's it the it ever it kept evolving. Um, so. Uh, I I fully enjoyed it, and I will say, um, if you are into um, sort of a detective type narratives, if you're into uh, stuff with like a lot of red herrings, you'll probably dig the show. Um, I'll also say I love the music. Like the opening song is really catchy. And I love the ending song. 
Mm, and it was both uh, very loop, good. Loop in my head, loop in my head for a while. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it makes me also want to check out their other Netflix uh, exclusive, uh, the Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven tie in, because I think if it's the same crew that did BNA, they probably knocked it out of the park for Cyberpunk, because uh, I could see them having very similar tones and vibes. So I'll have to check that out. Yeah. I could probably yeah, I think uh, that. Cyberpunk yeah. is Cyberpunk definitely feels more like a trigger thing holistically. There it's almost like a best of greatest hits trigger overall, but it does tend to have a solid narrative because the narrative is not by trigger. <laughs> it's <laughs> by the people holding the change to that franchise. Uh, Maybe something I think you'd enjoy. Same mm-hmm. way. Yeah, and so uh, unfortunately, because I think this was a Netflix thing, even with tr- triggers following, BNA kind of got lost in the shuffle. Unfortunately, but uh, uh, I, I had it. Yeah. I highly recommend it. Yeah, I think just, for me, the, yeah. the the real problem, if I'm being honest, is just this came out in the middle of the pandemic, and like we were all going through collective depression at that point. And I think because of that, because I really wasn't able to binge things the same way that I have in the past and even in the current. And because it wasn't striking it out of the park and firing on all cylinders, I think maybe that's why I just kind of fell off it. You know, I don't think I really hated it. It was just really tough for me to, to get to want to watch more. Yeah. And for me, I remember watching it in chunks and like really enjoying what I was watching, but never really being blown away. So it's a show that I would characterize as like a really solid 8 out of 10, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Like eminently enjoyable, mm-hmm. but it didn't knock my socks off. But I would recommend that people check it out. Hmm. Yeah, and I, I think for me, just because I'm, I'm much more into narrative, this engaged me a lot more. So I kept going to, okay, I want to see what happens next. Um, I, I kind of wonder I, if, because another I think with the the issue I have with the story here is it it's it's repeating a story that triggers told several times before this inherent racism in a beast you know between humans and beast like creatures and in Promare we had the Baroness which is it's just repeating the same story mm-hmm. I wonder if because you didn't jive with those this those other stories the way this is almost a noir mystery if maybe this resonated this this narrative structure resonated more with you because of that. I think what also helped is because this was a TV series, this had a lot more time to explore their world. Whereas in Premiere, it's a movie. <laughs> so yeah. th- there's some great characters in Premiere that I wish they had more screen time. Like I wish they would make Premiere into a TV show. I, I think I would enjoy Premiere a lot more if that right. was a TV series where things were more fleshed out and we could see more of like the fire crew. I loved the fire crew in Premiere, and I wish they, they're basically just there as like, isn't this a cool character design and like a cool one cool line or two? Uh, but we got to keep going. So I, I think because it was a, a like a, I'm repeating myself, but because it was a TV show and they were able to explore different aspects of the world, I was, was able to stay more engaged. Mm. Kind of looking into it now, it looks like it's only 12 episodes, too. I guess I was under the impression this was a two core series, which seems excessive for me, but yeah, maybe 12 episodes. I should go back and really revisit this all the way through. Mm. But uh, there there are some similarities between uh, this and Promare in terms of their narrative, which mm. I, I won't spoil. There is, there's one, oh, sure. re, there is one obvious thing that just made me go. Uh, okay well I guess you have to do that again <laughs> people, but, uh, people, people rag on people rag on Makoto Shinkai for telling the same story but yeah pro, it's a trigger they're not immune to that to that either oh for sure no yeah, I, I think like, starting here starting with Promare a lot of their visual designs and color designs they kind of repeated too yeah there's a lot of pinks and purples mm. and neon colors that were in Promare and very present in BNA and even in a cyberpunk of course mm-hmm. uh Similar color palette. Mm. I mean, change, really change a couple, more? change a couple aesthetic choices and a couple of world design details. I mean, from what I've seen of the cyberpunk anime, which is admittedly not much, it's like, well, it, it feels like, well, this is the this is like the edgy version of Brand New Animal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can see that. 
All right. Well, any sort of closing thoughts on BNA, Bill? Uh, just I'm, I'm glad I I found a trigger show that I kind of clicked with and that I uh, totally enjoy. I've, I, I, I've enjoyed trigger things to different extents, but this was the first trigger thing that I feel I really clicked with and really enjoyed. Well, let me, let me ask you this, Bill, since you're kind of the, the one non-trigger pervert here. Like, so you look at their shows, there's a, a, a thing in each one. Girl in the Gone had drills, Kill a Kill had clothes, BNA had furries. In your ideal next trigger show coming in 2023, what shtick do you think they should do? Uh, have they done anything with vehicles? Uh, Dino Xenon was kind of a transforming robot vehicle thing. Okay. Because that's, that's like one obvious thing that I don't know if they've done that or not. But yeah, like Dino Xenon and Gridman, but probably I have takes one. that spot. I have one. Uh, I'll go what for it also, Bill. <laughs> uh, magnets, because we need Trigger magnets. to let us know how those work. Exactly. That would be a fun show. Magnets. Brand new magnet. <laughs> you know, you heard it here, folks. Here's folks, 2024. All right, well, great show. Go check that out. And I think I'm going to close this off here with my last secret Santa choice. This was the, the main thing I knew I was going to, this immediately was my priority. Uh, Housing Complex C made it simply because it was four episodes. But the thing I knew that I was going to watch, beyond a shadow of a doubt, was Spance Daddy. I mean, yeah. Space Dandy. Space Woo. Dandy. <laughs> Woo! He's a dandy so, guy in space. This is a show that was started airing at the beginning of 2014. And from the moment it was announced, everyone was talking about it. I knew this was going to be one of those modern classics. It was kind of on my list. And I did watch the first two episodes, I want to say, when they aired. But again, just because things were going on in my life at the time, I didn't really catch up with it, did keep up with it. Um, so it kind of sat on the back of my list as one of those one day, one day series. And it sat there and probably would have stayed there were it not for when I met these two nerds that I'm on the podcast with. Hello. Uh, when Austin did his Shinichiro Watanabe panel uh, several years back, he mentioned Space Dandy and showed clips from that. And I think that brought it back into my collective, you know, collective conscious. The forefront of my mind was uh, you talking about it on your panels. Uh, then discovering that a few of my favorite directors, which I've also talked about on panels, uh, also did episodes that sort of pushed me to look more into it. And most recently, Bill did a panel on anime anthologies, uh, this just this past year, where he also mentioned, once again, Space Dandy. So this is one of those, you know how the universe keeps bringing stuff up at, yeah, in, in front of you? It's haunting you. Encouraging you to watch it? That is exactly what happened here. Is everyone keeps telling me to watch Space Dandy. And sure enough, even my secret Santa told me to watch Space Dandy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so even though Ka- Kaiji has been on my list in the same position, just knowing so much of what I do about Space Dandy, knew that it was going to be uh, the thing I would absolutely watch. And I'm glad for it. I absolutely can see why this is such a hit back in the day, why it is persisted. And unfortunately, I can see why it maybe hasn't had quite the lasting appeal that, say, Cow Bebop or even Champloo did, just because of the way that anime fandom has gone. Uh, but that being said, it still is just a, a great series. It's, it's, it's almost like the inverse of Cowboy Bebop, where Bebop is like, I would say the majority of Bebop is something like Great Pretender, where it's more serious, down to earth, if not sci-fi stories about bounty hunters with a little bit of comedy thrown in the mix and a lot of stylishness. Uh, Space Dandy is the vast majority of it comedy, really shocky uh, sci-fi or radio drama sort of sci-fi um combined with really goofy 
comedic episodes and you these, know i think the, the tropes that these characters are you know i think Wat- watanabe actually spoke to that at one point i might be making this up but i feel like he said one time in an interview that like cowboy bebop was like 80 percent drama 20 percent comedy <laughs> and space dandy's like 20 percent drama 80 percent comedy and like mm-hmm. he did that on purpose mm-hmm. it's funny you mentioned that because i was thinking what i was actually thinking what would the percentages be and i think 80 20 is a good way to put it yeah uh uh, both ways here but uh yeah if you love cowboy bebop the sort of structure of cowboy bebop but you wished it were more of the mushroom episodes for instance <laughs> uh space dandy uh space dandy has your back for sure do you wish that bebop had a musical episode well have i got the anime <laughs> for you <laughs> yeah it, it's 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 really great um i think some of the things that really stand out about it is just like bebop just like champloo they are very much uh, anthologies, and like Bill brought up in, in your panel, rather than an anthology movie, which is a tight, concise little format where you tell two or three or four stories in a with a common theme. This is twenty what, 26 episodes, and while we do have Shingo Natsume as the series director and Watanabe as the sort of general director as well, a lot of the Watanabe crew has been brought back. So we have episodes by Sayo Yamamoto. We have episodes written by Dai Sato. Uh, Goro Taniguchi shows up, as well as the aforementioned Sayansaru crew, and Young Choi and Masaki Yuasa have done guest episodes. So and um the and the late great like we, and the late great mm-hmm. Keiko Nobumoto as well worked a little exactly. bit on it. Yep. There's, I mean, I could go through each episode and talk a little about of each one, but you know, this is something you kind of have to see for yourself because the show, each episode is, is very different. And while they do share a lot of common themes, a lot of common jokes, uh, there's just some that stand out like the science or episodes. They are so drastically different than anything else. And even some of the later ones, uh, it goes from goofy fan servicey comedy stuff to a somber reflection on what is death and what is living. Uh, it kind of, it goes all over the place in a way that only an anthology could really. And uh, I guess that being said, that's, that's kind of go to some episodes that I thought stood out in general, just to give you an idea. So like, I think the very early episode, the Phantom Space Drama by Yamamoto really stood out to me. <laughs> you know, I knew you were going to say that one. Yeah. There's a lot of the sort of dandy tropes in here, but we do have where they t- find the restaurant with the, the Rama, the galactic space drama it, it goes really trippy and they go into like the ramen dimension and meet the the guy there that's making the ramen and we go into his backstory and it really shows even though we have dandy and QT and meow as the main characters the stuff the plants they go to and the backstories for these characters are really great analogs for human experiences and to see the the the, the ramen maker here as he sticks to his craft as a way to live is just it's kind of poignant in its own little way. Mm-hmm. The uh, the race episode is almost like a red line uh, sequel <laughs> in ways, really evocative of that and that sort of style of, uh, of fun. I think that was a, well, that was a madhouse thing and this is a bones production, but it does feel pretty similar in ways uh, to red line. I know there were some episodes where I walked away thinking, well, gosh, they've definitely, they definitely need, are going to follow up on this but then that kind of didn't happen. Like I remember the one episode where this might've been the Dai Sato one. I can't remember. It was the one where Dandy has to like take the, the young girl back to her family or something. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And I was just like, well, surely they're going to follow up on this. Um, And they kind of didn't, but that, that episode specifically was the first episode in the show that really signaled to me that this show was going to be something really uh, with the potential to be like really special and really uh, heartfelt rather than just like an animator's yeah, playground and like, you know, space hooters jokes. Um, and it's, de- it definitely is a lot of that. Um, but it also has some of those episodes that eh, they really do tug on your heartstrings. Like the episodes where late, late, way later on in the series with like, what's her name? Like Scarlet's backstory, right. or like her, yeah. her evolving relationship with Dandy. And mm-hmm. like some of the stuff with like Meow's family and things, like, th- like there's a lot in there. Like Space Dandy is a very complicated show. Like there's there's a lot going on. 
it, it yeah, goes through sure. a lot of moods sw- it goes through a lot of mood swings yeah where some episodes are extremely goofy and funny and some are really somber and other ones are very poignant like the the scarlet one you pointed to I, that, that almost kind of has a look of a, a, a tragic ending where it's almost like a, a lost love type ending to that episode mm-hmm. um which you, you wouldn't expect when you first see like the promos for space dandy as just like oh it's it's he's just he's just a goofy like johnny bravo type <laughs> idiot who, mm-hmm. who doesn't really know what he's doing a um, goofy guy you, in space yeah yeah you you wouldn't expect that sort of poignancy in space dandy I, I like you bring up uh, Scarlet. I really liked the stories that we got for both of the female characters. I was seeing sort of Scarlet rather than just be the nagging person at the at the desk. Mm-hmm. We see a little more about mm-hmm. her, and even Honey, the uh, I guess the the eye candy character from the aptly named Boobies uh, restaurant. Like she gets a lot more story as it goes on, and I kind of appreciated her more than just you know there for for fan service reasons. Don't they reveal, I can't, it's been ages since I watched this, don't they reveal that she's like some kind of like wonderkind, like super genius or something? I can't remember. She's, she's a member of a cloudium, a, like a species that keeps memories in clouds. Mm. And like we see she's, well, she's a half cloudium apparently. And so she has a ton of, yeah, she has a ton of knowledge, ton of information uh, stored in, in her brain. And Yeah. I really like that. I really like you mentioned every character gets their time to shine. And like when you go to Meow, the uh, Beetlejuice planet, and it's stuck in the Groundhog Day scenario. Mm. And I, th- I thought that was great. You're right. Because we have a an adult who goes back to his hometown, a very rural place. You see the people that never leave the hometown that are just stuck in the highlight, you know, the, the, the peak of their life and their teenage years, the people that just can't seem to escape. And it's something like nostalgic in a painful way about revisiting that. Um, if you guys have like ever gone back and revisited your old haunts from when you were a kid, it kind of, it feels good. It feels bad in the same way. And they really touch upon that. Uh, I really like the QT episode where he falls in love with the coffee maker Aww. and eventually turns into a giant robot <laughs> to, <laughs> to stem the robot revolution that the, I think is a toaster or a microwave. Something robot like starts. Uh, I of course love the the Uapa, the Uasa episode with the fish, the little fish astronaut tries mm-hmm. to get up to his planet to find that he's actually been completely forgotten about, and sees everything burn up, and he himself burns up because he's forgotten about by his family and loved ones. What, what that was really what neat. was that episode like where they land on the planet where like there's this these like rival countries, but it's only like a few people. Like the Vestians versus like the the sweaterians or something. Yeah, it's like the vest versus the underwear. That's like right. The, the pantsu, the pantsu <laughs> versus the the vest, and that was pretty funny as well. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> and, uh, I what, did you, the, what did you think the, of the? Uh, oh, go ahead, Bill. Uh, I was just, this, if we're talking about just episodes we loved, I, I love the musical <laughs> episode, the one where they go to the he goes to the high school planet. It's it's like Beverly Hills. Not it's not yeah. Beverly Hills High, but it is it is Beverly Hills that. High. Close yeah, enough. Yeah, Beverly Hills. Okay, and basically it's like they saw they they saw like a High School Musical or some sort of equivalent musical and said we're going to do that, um, and that's just a lot of fun because Dandy goes in and thinks he's like super cool when no, you're even below the jan- the janitor, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and just him him trying to. Uh, get up the hierarchy with his musical abilities is quite fun. Uh, I, I don't oh, I'm sorry, I don't... but I despise that episode. I'm sorry, Bill. Oh, <laughs> really? I, I, I was too, I'm too old for high school musical. I think the whole thing is, is schlocky trash. I don't like that genre at all. So the fact that I get it, it was funny. I like the fact that they dub. And by the way, I watched the dub on this, which is the choice to make. Uh, I will say yeah. as a dub hater, watch the dub. <laughs> I appreciate that they did give, like doing a, a dub adaptation of the songs. I just despise the high school musical thing. And unfortunately oh. that kind of cut into my enjoyment of it. I thought it was, I appreciate the work, but I didn't. <laughs> like it, so. <laughs> well, I, I guess just, I, I'm more akin to like musicals. Uh, mm. And and like you said, I, 
I'm not a dub watcher all the time, but the the, the dub that Funimation did at the time uh, does a fantastic job. I think Ian Sinclair is the <laughs> voice of Dandy. Yes, he does a fantastic job. And um, uh, oh, what's her name? She's the voice of uh, Scarlet. She's also the voice of uh, Luffy. Oh, um, Colleen Clinkenbeard. Yeah, Colleen Clinkenbeard is the is the voice of Scarlet, and she's great. And it just seems like the dub cast just had a ton of fun uh doing the show so uh, yeah i would highly recommend the dub the dub is pretty one, excellent one flourish on the dub that i don't think they did in japanese is that they put like a auto-tune filter on the voice of qt for the english okay. dub and i think it, it definitely makes it have that sort of uh robotic but still kind of cutesy quality to that um to complement that actor's performance. And I don't think they did that in the Japanese version. I think it's just like, maybe there's like a, like a mild filter, but it's not done in that like auto-tune way where you can obviously hear that it's like filtered through something. Yeah, I, I watched this with the dub with the subtitles on, uh, as I usually would, would watch subtitles regardless. And I, again, if they're just comparing the two, seeing both reading and hearing it, I think the dub added a lot of character to this. Even even the narrator gets a lot more mm. um, character in the dub than the subtitles would would let on. <laughs> the narrator is so great. Um, what did What did you think of the the villains overall that were following Dandy throughout his adventures? <laughs> I, I enjoyed it. I think one of the cool things you know about Bebop, for instance, is that we don't really hear that much about Spike's backstory except in like three episodes where they shows up, and likewise here we get a lot of backstory that's hidden in the margins. We learn as time goes on about the, what the Jaiko and the Gel, Gel, the, the something. Gel Goog. The, yeah. The Gel Goog empire is the, the bad one. The Jaiko or the, is the guy like in the rock and roll episode mm-hmm. uh, who runs the, that like we hear about these, these empires in the background. We hear about the alien planets and the alien registration. We get a lot of this, this neat, I guess this backstory in the margins in a way that again, it doesn't matter, but it's kind of interesting. And and likewise, I liked Dr. Gel and B as recurring villains. They're, they're just fun character designs. Like Dr. Gel is, he's a, he's a monkey. He's an orangutan with, he's got like a, he looks like a one piece character. Actually, now that I think <laughs> about it, he's a monkey man, but he's got this goofy looking <laughs> hair and a hat. He's got a, a monocle, which is the big G because <laughs> the, the Gogo empire like he looks like a one piece character really silly and the ship they ride around in looks like the head of the um statue of liberty but it's got a ball gag on it it's just very <laughs> out there and strange and something about it it's kind of it's, it's stylized in a way and you know speaking of stylized the opening the opening and the oh, ending man. to be honest were great i loved i listened to viva namida every single time it's so it's, it's such, such a, a good bomb. song great it's song awesome. And the, the opening animation is just, it's fun. It, it exactly tells you everything you need to know about this. And there's so many references that you find out about later as you watch the series, like the robots and the, the mecha and whatnot. And it's just fun to see it all come together in a great opening animation. But uh, yeah, was the, the general way this thing was structured, even though they're independent episodes, the way it comes together with these recurring characters, with Scarlet, with Honey, uh, with you know, boobies as an institution, the, the restaurant itself, um, in Dr. Gel, like everything comes together in a way that feels cohesive and nice, even though it's been handed to so many other people throughout yeah, the anthology. It's certainly rare for an anthology to feel co- so cohesive as, as Dandy does. I mean, I think mm-hmm. Dandy as a format was sort of set up to be very open and you can kind of do whatever you want in it. But it works in, in the way that like Lupin the Third works, where it's just like the characters are basic enough that you could put them anywhere and it always works exactly we could we could see more but you know i kind of think that 26 episodes is enough i don't yep i would rather them not try to bring yeah, it back and I agree. ruin it yeah uh, i like what we got I, I didn't mention some of the other animators like the one episode with the they go and fight the big fish and the planet full of water that was animated by uh, Kiyotaka Oshiyama, who directed Flip Flappers hmm. and worked on Dino Coil. And there's definitely some uh, nuance there you can see with his style. And even the the episode about death, which, by the way, like I watched a lot, this, a lot of the show is really easy to watch. Um, I watched the episode about death, which is like episode 21 or so near the end yesterday. And I was high as a kite. 
And mm. that was the one episode you should not watch High as a Kite because it makes no <laughs> sense as it is. But it's talking about death and what it means to, to be dead and live on. The director for that, Yasuhiro Nakura, worked on character designs for the Moomin television show. Mm. <laughs> uh, another, also, another series notoriously about death. Exactly. And he also did animation on like Inuo and Angel's Egg. So wow. that gives you an idea of how wild that episode was stylistically. Again, very, very interesting to watch while I was intoxicated. But not, I would <laughs> not definitely not recommend it. But I do think that it, it spoke to me in a way that feels more high minded than, you know, say the episode where they're going through dimensions and the alternate dandies, like the little Goku dandy. <laughs> yes. And the meow that is a, is a, like a hot girl. <laughs> An emo dandy. <laughs> exactly. Oh, that's the best part, man, where he's like, I just want to die. And there's like the meow that's a dude holding his helmet. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> lest we not forget the zombie episode that kind of sets you up for the whole thing. It's just like in that episode, it escalates to the point where the entire universe becomes zombified. <laughs> and then the episode's over. But by the next episode that airs, none of that they just completely ignore it like <laughs> yep exactly so good i appreciated the zombie episode it didn't just end with the zombies like everyone became zombies but learned how to continue living right being <laughs> <laughs> that end of itself yogurt. that end of itself is a hilarious joke <laughs> and that, as zombies the narrator, they learned how to continue on living <laughs> and that, that's an episode that really highlights the narrator and just how like his mm-hmm. it's very um uh uh uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the way the narrator do- acts <coughs> sometimes, like he's exactly like the narrator from Hitchhiker's Guide to the mm-hmm. Galaxy, where he's very he's very dry, but his dry sense of uh, way of presenting the information is very funny. <laughs> yeah, I, I love the narrator as a character. He, he certainly adds something to the show as a whole. Mm. I, I, well, should, what can I, I should, go ahead. So I I forgot to I remember when this show came out. This show was a Cartoon Network exclusive, I think, where it aired mm-hmm. ex- yep. Fir- yep. it aired here first, and I I think it's gained an appreciation as time is going on. But I think people were a bit bummed out because when they saw Watanabe's name, they thought they were going to get more Bebop based off the initial promos, and uh, that kind of made people kind of not as engaged with it when it first came out, like in twenty thirteen. But I think as yeah, time has gone on, people have really appreciated it more. Yeah, and this this show is significant for a number of reasons, but it's also historically significant in that regard because I think this was the first show where they started using the phrase simul dub because mm-hmm. it was coming out here in English yeah. first, and then it would come out a few hours later in Japan. But, you know, of course, they would finish the episodes in Japan first and then send them to the U.S. to be dubbed, like, really quickly. And before that, there was really not a precedent for, like, weekly anime dubs being done by american companies like that just was not a thing and now nowadays you know with stuff like spy family and chainsaw man i mean there's a little bit more of a slow turnaround it's maybe like two weeks but nowadays we get dubs almost immediately like that and that was just not the case in like 2013 right exactly Hmm. i think that may have caused me to let it slide by the wayside at that point. We didn't we didn't know that the Space Dandy dub was going to be amazing. So the fact that that was what was coming out first, like of course, most weebs like us, like at least with me, I'd rather watch the 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 sub the Japanese with English subtitles. I think maybe that put me off a little bit uh, watching at the time, but I'm glad that I have been corrected. Uh, only uh, only like eight years later. Only eight years <laughs> later. Yeah. What is it's, time? It's, <laughs> yeah, what's the, I? I don't really know what else to say. It is a great time. I'm incredibly glad I watched it. Thank you, Secret Santa, for putting this on my list and making me finally, much to Austin and Bill's enjoyment, sit down and watch all of Space Dandy. It was uh, a great time, and I loved it. Would I absolutely recommend it? And I probably will be trying to find a physical release of this because I feel like it deserves a spot on my shelf. I have one. If you want to just look at it, <laughs> just look at it. <laughs> yep. Those of you who know me, like I'm not a big physical kind of guy. I'm perfectly fine with keeping digital files on hand and, and whatnot. But if I want something particular on my shelf, that means it's I either found it cheap or I wanted it there in particular. And this feels like a show that I want in particular to be on my shelf. 
All right. Well, I guess that wraps us up here. We are almost at the two hour mark. So I think we've discussed anything. Any closing thoughts on either the Secret Santa thing as a whole or any shows that we watched? I love Anime Secret Santa. I think it's really fun. I will continue to participate in it every year that I remember to sign up for it for as long as it's around. And uh, whoever's running it next time, whether that's Vinny or Corey or somebody else, as long as it's not me, uh, I will be there. So this was a really fun time. And thank you to whoever my Santa was. Great picks. And I will watch Kill Me Baby one day. (laughs) Uh, I'm really glad that I got over my weariness and finally did this. This was a lot of fun. And it got me to explore things on my backlog that I might not have gotten to. So I, I think it's a genius concept. I hope it keeps going as long as it can. And I can't wait to do it next year. Yeah, completely agree. Um, I Now that I have my Anime Planet set up, I've actually been using it, watching all the seasonally stuff. And I'll probably continue to use it. So nothing else that encouraged me to cover that hurdle and... The next year rolls around, I'll certainly be participating as well. So what's coming up next for us after people listen to this episode? What they, what can they expect for the remainder of 2022 from Third Impact Anime? Well, just like we've given you guys, our audience, a Christmas present, you will also be getting a, a New Year's present. We are going to do a best of 2022 list. Uh, for those of you who are older fans, may remember we would do top 10 lists at the end of every year as blog posts on our website. But uh, as Austin said earlier, we're podcast, damn it. We're not a bloggers. We should put this stuff in audio format. So hopefully within the next week, you will be getting a stitched together episode with all of us talking about our favorite things, whether it be anime or video games or television shows or anything. Uh, We'll be talking about what 2022 meant to us. And shortly after that, I want to say in January, we'll be getting uh, formally getting our fall 2022 episode where you know all the shows all the great stuff we've been getting this season we're going to be talking about it and i imagine that will be uh, another five hour episode mm. <laughs> if bill is involved be, it definitely it's, will it's, it's gonna be me with my like 10 shows that i watched and then you guys just go that's the problem let's keep moving we gotta go is that we this time we all watched 10 shows. <laughs> so it will not just be you talking. It will be all of us talking. And I think we all uh, really enjoyed this season. So that's going to be a long one for sure. I'm excited uh, to get back to this season because I kind of put a lot of that stuff on hold because I wanted to get through my Secret Santa thing. But now that I'm done with yeah. that, it's back to seasonal anime. Good stuff. And speaking of indie year cleanup, I think, Austin, you've just created a Mm -hmm. survey for audience members to take. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So uh, we just want I I created like a quick little survey to kind of just get a gauge of where our listeners are with, uh, you know, how they're feeling about the podcast. Uh, Generally speaking, got a couple of like multiple choice questions just so we can get your feedback on how you're feeling about stuff, you know, like. Uh, are you listening to our sub shows like Kotatsu Corner, like Bill and Tobias's uh, uh, Grand Line Reborn? Are you listening to uh, Conversations? How did you find out about the Third Impact Anime Podcast? What other anime podcasts do you listen to? What other types of episodes would you like to hear from us in the future? Just a couple questions like that. And I've got a survey that I've created that you can find over on our Twitter account. And it's also up on our website. So if you don't mind, and it'll be in the show notes for this episode. So yeah, if you don't mind, just take a couple of moments and fill that out. It's mostly multiple choice, requires very little brain power, and it would really brighten our day. Uh, Speaking of brightening our day, it would also be really cool if you went over to Apple Podcasts and left us a rating and a review so that we can make that algorithm really happy. Exactly. Like, um, you know, listening to podcasts, there's a lot of platforms out there, but Apple is the one that seems to matter the most. So if you have an Apple account, if you don't, if you could take the time just to sort of download iTunes real quick, just to give us a review, that's a big ask, I know, but that would help us out a whole lot. We haven't gotten a review in like over a year, and I think that's a shame. So if you're listening out there, be our favorite person of December 2022. You will get a a metaphysical gold star from me specifically if you go on there and write us a review. But if um, reviews really aren't your thing, if maybe you're listening to this episode in the far future and the survey link isn't active any longer, 
You can certainly send us feedback. Our main website is thirdimpactanime.com where we have all the old blog posts we talk about. We have episodes, links to our episodes, as well as show notes there. Um, We also have a Patreon that you will find linked there as well. So maybe you really like this podcast and want to support us in a way that isn't downloading iTunes. You can throw us a few bucks that way, get access to a few exclusive uh, roles and channels in our Discord server, and the eternal undying love of us, us three people, and everyone else on the podcast. However, if you want to speak to us individual, we all are social media nerds. Uh, Austin, where can people find you on the internet? People can find me most easily over on Twitter while it still exists and is usable at Bebop Shock. You can also find me on Mastodon at the same thing. And Bill, where can people find you on the internet? Um, right now in the social media wild west world that we're living in i'm still on the twitter seeing if the ship will go down at wb foreman 999 we'll see if any other of the ships or airplanes are able to take off based off the metaphor that you prefer uh (laughs) but yeah you'll you'll find me on the twitter currently retweeting about uh anime uh books and other random things of my liking so you can find me there People should also join our Discord. That too. The dis- the Discord, as of late, has been a lot of fun. A lot of uh, people have come in as of late, and it's been a really fun conversation with a lot of new people. So mm-hmm. if you also are trying to get off the Twitter, the Twitter plane or the Twitter ship, you can hop on over to our Discord. That's been a lot of fun. I've enjoyed the uh, camaraderie on the Discord server as of late. Yeah, and a lot of people say that. They mention that. You should join our great, amazing Discord. It's so awesome. You should join it. <laughs> but I really do feel like it's it's true lately because so many people are ready to get off Twitter, are ready for it to collapse. And there have actually been a lot of people sign up and a lot more discussion than just saying so. So if you want to get in, maybe not on the ground floor, but while things are still pretty early on, if you want to be a, a veteran, a well-known veteran of uh, our community, no better opportunity than to do so now. And that's probably the best bet to speak to me. Uh, I am also on Twitter at Reverend underscore Tobias. Although I'm taking a bit of a break currently. So you can also find me there at Mastodon. And I think I've got a co-host you should be able to find with that as well. But I'll be around in one way or another. Feel free to reach out to me there. All right, guys. Well, I think that wraps us up. I'm trying to think of a funny Christmassy sign off but have a merry have a merry christmas in space baby and a happy (laughs) and a happy new year (laughs) all right guys that's been our uh, secret sign episode i hope you enjoyed it if you have any thoughts on our picks our commentary on these episodes feel free to reach out but other than that have a merry christmas to santa it's awesome that he gives out presents but that guy's totally breaking and entering i mean when i was a kid that really freaked me out i wouldn't go around insulting the legacy of a saint if i were you you horrid child